Hey guys, and welcome to your first flips lesson with me, Mr. Quigley. Before we start, let me briefly tell you how to make the most of this video. First, you should watch this video before our lesson so that you learn the content and are ready to apply it in the lesson. Second, you should watch this video as many times as you like until you feel you have learnt the content. To help with this, you should complete the quiz that I have given you to see if you need to watch the video again or are confident with the information. Finally, you should come to the lesson prepared with at least one question to ask about the topic. Once you have done all this, you should be ready and able to apply your knowledge in the lesson. Now that we have covered that, let's move on to the topic at hand. So today we are going to examine participant observations as a research method used by sociologists to study society. Participant observations occur when a researcher actually takes part in the everyday life activities of a certain social group. This is different to non-participant observations, as here the researcher simply observes the group without taking part in their activities. There are also two different types of participant observations, overt and covert, but we will come back to these later on. Before conducting a participant observation, there are a few things that sociologists must consider. The first concerns getting into the selected social group. Obviously, some groups will be easier to enter than others. For example, a football crowd is far easier to gain access to than a criminal organisation. To gain entry to a group, a sociologist must first make contact, which, in order to be successful, may require certain skills or characteristics. For example, imagine you would like to study a motorcycle gang, but you yourself cannot ride a motorcycle. That initial contact will not go well and you will be rejected from the group. If the initial contact does go well, then the researcher must gain acceptance from the group. This may prove difficult as some groups are often suspicious of new members and some won't accept you due to your age, gender, class or ethnicity. There have been cases of people going to extreme lengths to be accepted. For example, in 1962, John Howard Griffin used medication and sun lamp treatments to change his skin colour in order to experience racism in the deep south of the USA. Once a researcher is in a group, their next concern should be staying in the group. To stay, a researcher must do what is expected of them and follow instructions. However, this poses an issue. The researcher must be involved to understand the group, but risks becoming overly involved that they are no longer objective and start to identify with the group, leading to bias observations. This is called going native. Now, let's return to overt and covert observations, as a researcher must decide which one they want to use. Overt observations are when a researcher does not lie to a group and informs them that they are being observed and are researching their behaviours and actions. Some sociologists favour this method because it avoids any ethical issues by gaining fully informed consent. It also allows the researcher to openly take notes and ask silly questions without the fear of being found out. Researchers can also check with group members that they have understood something properly, again without the fear of being found out. However, there are two major disadvantages of overt observations. First, a group may simply refuse to give you their permission to study them. For example, think about criminal gangs. How many of them would happily allow someone to observe and document their criminal activities? And secondly, knowing you are being researched is likely to cause the Hawthorne effect, where people will act differently around the researcher, thereby making the observations invalid. Covert observations, on the other hand, are the complete opposite. These studies are carried out undercover, where a researcher lies about who they are and what their intentions are, in order to be viewed as an actual member of the group. Some prefer this method as it reduces the risk of creating the Hawthorne effect and is sometimes the only way of obtaining valid results. 
Also, by lying about your identity, you are less likely to be refused entry by a group. Think again about the criminal gang. Lying about your identity may be the only way to enter the gang. However, this method also has some disadvantages. First, the researcher must keep up their act or their cover will be blown, which can have serious consequences. Second, the researcher cannot openly take notes or else they'll be found out. They therefore have to rely on their own memory to document observations, which can affect the validity of their findings. The researcher can also not ask silly questions that are needed to clarify misunderstandings, again causing results to become invalid. Finally, although the Hawthorne effect is believed to be reduced by lying to participants, the fact that there is a new member of the group could still affect group behaviours and cause the Hawthorne effect. There are also a lot of ethical issues with covert observations. First, it's immoral to lie and deceive people. Most research organisations require researchers to gain in fully informed consent. Second, researchers may have to participate in immoral or illegal activities to remain undercover. This could even include causing harm to others when researching criminal groups. Finally, if a researcher is witness to such acts, they have a moral and legal obligation to intervene or report them to the police. Some may not want to do this as it will ruin their research. In more general terms, sociologists have identified a number of advantages and disadvantages for all participant observations. First, it is argued that there are higher levels of validity than other research methods, for example, questionnaires. Observations gain rich qualitative data that provides a picture of how a group really lives. Secondly, observations are believed to offer researchers more insight and understanding of social groups. This personal understanding is called Verstehen, a German word meaning empathy, or quite simply, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Finally, observations are flexible. Rather than starting a study with a fixed hypothesis, a researcher enters a group with an open mind and new experiences can lead to a change of focus. This links heavily to grounded theory, as theories that the researchers produce are grounded in real life. As a result of these perceived advantages, Participant observations are favoured by interpretivists as it provides the most valid picture of reality and focuses on the individual. However, there are also a number of disadvantages that accompany participant observations. First, there are a number of practical issues. Observations can be very time and money consuming. Also, a researcher must be fully trained and have good observation and interpersonal skills to be successful, and this research can itself be stressful and demanding. There are also issues with representativeness. Because of the costly and timely nature of observations, it is likely that only one group will be observed. This makes it difficult to generalise findings to other groups. For example, one criminal gang may behave very differently to another. Observations are also not reliable. Because research depends on the personal observations of a lone researcher, it is unlikely that another researcher will be able to replicate the findings. Additionally, as we have already mentioned, a researcher could go native, and their findings would become subjective and biased, calling into question the validity of their findings. Due to these disadvantages, positivists reject the method and argue that it focuses too much on the micro level and wider structural forces, aka macro levels, are ignored. To conclude, participant observations can be a useful method for gaining insight into social groups to create a picture that is true to life. However, 
there are several things that must be considered before starting an observation. A researcher must have the skills to make initial contact and then be accepted to the group. Once in the group, the researcher must avoid going native to ensure unbiased observations. The researcher must also decide whether their observations will be overt or covert. Overt observations are more ethical and practical, but there is a higher risk of being refused entry and producing the Hawthorne effect. Covert observations are the opposite and are believed to produce the most valid and true to life results, but are very unethical and impractical. Participant observations as a whole are favoured by interpretivists because they are valid, gain more insight and are flexible, leading to findings that are grounded in real life. However, positivists do not like this method as results are not reliable and there is too much focus on the micro level and not enough on the macro, aka the wider structural factors. So guys, that's all you need to know about participant observations. Your job now is to complete the quiz that I've given you to see how much you've learnt. If you are still unclear, watch the video again until you feel confident. Don't forget to have at least one question to ask about the topic for next lesson. Thanks guys, see you soon.